is our light, just back from illuminating his colleagues at the minister's, minister's conference in Salt Lake City, Utah, Utah, Utah. We have him here with us. May I invite you to put your hands together and welcome our beacon of light, beloved Reverend John Scott. Good morning, friends. Or as one of the, the young people said, good morning, church family. Don't you just love that? We learn such, such a lot from young people. Joy to add my own words of welcome uh, to you all here at the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living and to those joining us on the World Wide Web in consciousness. How many of you used to play this little game with dominoes? Sometimes I used to do it with uh, packs of cards. You would stand them all up. How many people do that? Can I see a, sense of, a show of hands? Oh, two. Very good. Now we have iPads, iPods, um, and all kinds of wonderful stuff, so we don't need these childlike entertainments and pastimes. Can you say with me, I am the light of my world? In a half voice, in a, a, a whisper, say it in your heart. One of the people who uh, was a light to my world has been coming to church every Sunday. Her name is Jean Barnes. Welcome, Jean. You were a light in my world, and I remember coming to what, what is now a Tuesday evening service uh, used to be on a Wednesday. And I used to, when I was first coming here, sit there in absolute awe because this woman would pull out a prayer request from, from the box and speak for half an hour on some, some principle of truth. She was, in fact, what I would call the lead domino. She started a chain reaction, which um, I think has brought me to where I stand this morning. So yes, I was at the 2016 Centers for Spiritual Living Annual Conference in Salt Lake City, Utah from February 22 to 25. And it was an amazing, love-filled, high-energy gathering of our ministers, practitioners, and laity from all around the world. And during our time together, we shared our core values, we discussed ideas on how we can fulfill the global mission of Centers for Spiritual Living, which is creating a world that works for everyone. And that's a phrase that has given me a lot of pause to think, because I do believe we already live in a world that works for everyone. It works for everyone according to their consciousness and their level of understanding of life and its happenings. So when we say our global vision is to help create a world that works for everyone, we're really talking about up-leveling the consciousness, which brings us to the global mission. The global vision is a world that works for everyone. The global mission is awakening humanity to its spiritual magnificence so that the world will work at the level of that magnificence. Does that make sense? So the conference dealt with that, and you'll be happy to hear that Reverend Dr. Ken Gordon was returned unopposed as president of our, our movement. So he sends love for the Temple of Light family in Jamaica and hopes to visit us. Yes. He hopes to visit us again um, this year. And then uh, Reverend Dr. John Waterhouse, um, that post of president has been discontinued, and he now assumes the post of what is known as field leader. His, 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 his duties remain very much the same. He is on the executive team and the leadership council, and he is very involved with the, the Department of Licensing and Credentials, so that those people who want to become practitioners, um, when we have done our practitioner studies beginning in January, that kind of activity takes place under um, the guidance and leadership of Reverend Dr. John Waterhouse, the field leader. 
There were two presentations in Salt Lake City which, which made the trip worthwhile for me. Um, one was by the Centers for Spiritual Living, Diversity, and um, I think they call themselves the Diversity Commission. And I will share with you in a future Sunday encouragement so, some of the details of that. It was fascinating the way to see how our movement is looking at how we can be more inclusive of all other faiths and of all other uh, human activities while following the path of Jesus the Christ and following that teaching, embracing all the various aspects of human endeavor in all its beauty and its, its, its richness and its, and its love. So that, I will share that with you on another Sunday. But the one that I wanted to share today was by uh, a presenter known as Don Hobbs, who is the executive vice president of a firm in Austin, Texas, which is uh, specializing in business training, business models, and coaching. The first thing that he pointed out, which struck a chord with me, is that you don't have too many things to do. You don't have too many things to do. You just do too many things. I thought, wow. Now think about that. You don't have too many things to do. You just try to do too much, as we say in Jamaica. And can I see a show of hands again for those people who make a to-do list on a daily basis? What about those who make a mental to-do list? Uh-huh, two more. Very good. You don't have too much to do. But you know what we do? We add, we attribute or ascribe equal importance to everything we have to do on our to-do list today. Now, according to Hobbes, our first mistake is to imagine that they all have equal importance. You have to set a priority. And sometimes people have stuff for you to do which is urgent for them or important for them, but has nothing to do with your priorities for the day. So, you know, I'll be in the middle of, of writing a Sunday message, and I have a, a good friend who will call me and say, um, what, how do you um, cook snow peas and broccoli? Can you give me an interesting recipe for a mixed veg with, and I'm saying, I'm, I'm writing my Sunday message, and I've asked you not to phone on a Saturday when I'm in that me mental space. So it's important for her because she has people coming to dinner tonight, but it had nothing to do with me. Um, Hobbes points out that we have an average of some 43 interruptions in an eight-hour day. And we don't even need other people to interrupt us because we have an average of about 4,000 conscious thoughts, and those do their own interrupting, as you know. And then he posed for me what was the million dollar question, and that I want to share with you this morning. And the question is what's the one thing you can do? The one thing you can do such that by doing it, everything else will be easier or unnecessary. Choose the one thing, I see somebody shaking her head around the back. Choose the one thing that you could do such that by doing it, everything else will be easier for you or even unnecessary. I left that presentation thinking, if our global, if our global vision is indeed a world that works for everyone, and our mission is awakening humanity to its spiritual magnificence, there are so many things we need to do to accomplish that mission, yes? And then I thought about Jamaica at this time in our young history, and I was away for that, the day of the, of the election. And I thought in our young history, when I got back home, given the photo finish across the tape in the, in the race for political uh, power and supremacy, What's the one thing we can do as a nation? What's the one thing we can do as citizens of this nation and of the world that we want to work for everyone? What's the one thing we here at the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living can do such that by doing it, we would be spreading this truth exponentially throughout Jamaica and the wider world? 
Hobbes made the point that the one thing has a domino effect. You play that game? When you go home today, try it. That's a powerful effect. One thing, the lead domino, can set a train of causation into motion that can change your entire world, your entire experience, and indeed, the experience of the entire world. And so the morning after that one thing presentation, I went at 5 a.m. to the prayer room for which I had signed up. And it, at the conference, this is interesting, every year we have a prayer room. It's dedicated and consecrated at the beginning of the conference. And some of us sign up to serve in the prayer room. And what happens is you can leave, if you're attending the conference, a prayer request for yourself or someone in the request box in the prayer room. So you have a stack of requests. And when we go in at our assigned times or our chosen times, we pick out one request and we will pray with whatever that is, and then we put a tick on it and put it back in the box at the bottom of the pile. The next person comes. So it's very interesting. You can see how many ticks some requests have got during the, the period that we're away, um, during the period of the conference. Well, I was in there doing that, and the first request I picked up the morning after that, that uh, one thing presentation was a prayer request that read something to the effect of, please pray that my one thing be revealed to me. <laughs> yes? You may place your prayer request in the prayer request box in the vestibule. Well, as I did a treatment of light, we want, you want something to be revealed to you, we pray for light which is spiritual wisdom, spiritual understanding, spiritual perception, to know which way to go, what to do. As I was treating, doing a treatment of light, the words of the psalmist came to me, yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. It's really funny because that was in, in Salt Lake City. And then I get back home here, and last Thursday we're doing a class on Thursday morning on practical mysticism. And in the class, the same quotation came up, and I had to Google it and find out that it was from Psalm 139, verses 11 and 12. We were talking in that class about what is called uh, by the mystics the dark night of the soul. And that quotation just, just was like a, a beacon of, of light in my, in my own mind. And so the answer to the one thing question dawned in my own consciousness as I prayed for light for the person who wanted to know what their one thing was. The spirit clearly said to me, John, you are the lead domino. Let your light so shine. And so the title of my encouragement today is, You Are the Lead Domino. Let your light so shine. Can you say, uh, affirm with me, I am the lead domino? I am the lead domino. I let my light so shine. You know, I believe most of us here know that in reality, God is omnipresent, omniscient, and, and omnipotent. We've been, we've been, we have accepted that for a long time. There is no place then, I think we'll agree, where the light of God is not shining. And the experience of darkness is always temporary. And when we experience it, it really is a call to turn on the light of truth within us. But that is sometimes easier said than done. Let us say a problem arises in your life. It may relate to work or finances or relationships or health or to your spiritual path. Sometimes it can be all of the above. At these times, you can feel alone, abandoned by, and separated from God. Darkness seems to be your total experience. In times such as these, you may even question God. You say to yourself, but I'm a science of man student. I've been coming to the temple for years, and I know that everything is God, so why am I experiencing this darkness? What am I doing or not doing? I'm doing my prayer work, so I shouldn't be going through this. Sounds familiar? 
Sadly, some people feeling overwhelmed by the darkness stop coming to church. I say sadly because it is precisely during these dark times that we most need our spiritual family and our spiritual community. All of us, and I mean all of us, including ministers and practitioners, go through periods like these, and sometimes quite often. Although it is hard to fathom when you are experiencing them, I want you to know that they really are indications that powerful transformations are taking place within our consciousness. And the class last Thursday was titled From Silkworm to Butterfly. And you think about the chrysalis. What's happening in that chrysalis? It's a dark place for the little creature, but something wonderful is happening that is going to allow something so beautiful and, and ephemeral and wonderful to emerge in all its beauty. So it could work this way. As you discover the path of truth, you learn how to pray affirmatively and, and how to meditate, of course. And we establish a regular routine of reading truth literature and other daily practices designed to align us with pure spirit. So far, so good since this sets us up for great spiritual growth and profound changes for the better in our life. We have set up the dominoes. Hopefully, the spacing is correct, because if the spacing isn't correct, what happens? You stop the chain somewhere along the line. Some people have to work really hard on their spiritual path, on eliminating jealousy or anger or or whatever it is. Mine was eliminating impatience and being judgmental. I still work on it regularly. Some people have to work on various aspects, health challenges, financial challenges, whatever. But whatever it is that we need to release, as we sincerely seek the consciousness and recognition of at one which is another way of saying atonement, with pure spirit, all that is unlike God in us begins to be sloughed off like so much dead skin, and we are left with a deeper awareness of who and what we truly are, the image and likeness of Almighty God. And so if you're going through a period of seeming darkness, my friends, in your life right now, know with me that what is really happening is that the falsehoods, the lies that you have believed about yourself, those, those untruths are dying. You have somehow falsely identified with ideas that are contrary to what is truly real about you, and your pain is a symptom that you are experiencing an identity crisis. So the times when you are experiencing what has been called the dark night of the soul can be regarded as periods of refinement during which you are letting go of false notions about who you are and what you represent. And who you are, my friends, is God. And what you represent is good. I know me says so. It is the beautiful Jesus who quoted the Psalm, Psalm 82, verse 6, which reads, I have said ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. Unquote. So during your dark times, don't stay away from church. Call one of our ministers or practitioners so we can pray with you and help you light the lamp of faith, which always dispels the darkness. Dr. Arnold Fox, an MD who authored a book titled Beyond Positive Thinking, tells a story, which I've told before, but I think it's worth uh, repeating, of a small, frail-looking woman named Sally, who was a su survivor of the Nazi concentration camps. He met her when he had just completed his medical training. Sally was in a hospital ward dying of cancer, and she was considered by the hospital staff to be a very troublesome patient. Sally demanded to know what was in each syringe before she would allow the nurse to give her an injection, and she insisted on justification for each test ordered by her doctors. She complained about the hospital food and the stuffy atmosphere on the ward and the uncomfortable hospital bed. And as if that wasn't enough of a headache for the hospital staff, Sally insisted on keeping a lit candle on her nightstand. Dr. Fox said he, assu he assumed she had it there for religious comfort. According to Fox, 
The physicians, nurses, and technicians soon learned it was easier to go along with Sally's demands than argue it out. Besides, everyone knew she was going to die soon. Uh, one of her do the senior doctors had written on her chart SDTH. SDTH stands for Start Digging the Hole. And that was a clue to any of the doctors who came on and reading her docket that here, here's a troublesome one, but hold on, it, it won't be with you much longer. Fox relates how late one night he sat by Sally's bed listening to her tales of the concentration camps. After she had described some of her adventures, he asked her how she had survived the starvation, the savage beatings, and the abusive overwork, as well as the exposure to severe winter conditions protected only by a few rags. Sally told him that the ones who survived were the ones who believed they could survive. She said the ones who didn't believe died quickly. The believers, on the other hand, constantly looked, bargained, and schemed for an extra crumb of bread, a tiny scrap of paper or cloth to make their shoe warmer, a better bunk, a tiny sliver of soap with which to wash themselves. The believers in their own survival grabbed every little something that could aid their survival. Sally told Dr. Fox something I find most interesting. She said the people who did not believe they could survive had a certain look in their eyes. Quote, you could tell they had faith, negative faith. They knew they were going to die, so they never looked for that extra crumb to eat or that scrap of paper to ease the blister of an ill-fitting shoe. Those who did not look, of course, never see their opportunities. Even in a concentration camp, there are some, some very few, but some opportunities. Unquote. Marveling at the strength of the young Sally, Fox said, then you must have believed you would make it right from the start. But her answer shocked him, for she said, no, I thought I would be dead in a week. Some of the other women tried to teach me how to survive, but I knew I was going to die. I didn't even try, unquote. If you didn't try, how did you survive? How did you stay alive, Fox asked. Then Sally explained how her faith turned from negative to positive. An older woman, a veteran prisoner, made Sally join her in a little ritual she performed every morning and evening, snatching back from their captors a few seconds of time twice a day. The woman lit an imaginary candle with an imaginary match. Setting the imaginary candle into a non-existent holder, she stepped back admiring the flame that was not there. As Fox put it, surrounded by filthy, starving, disease-ridden women who most likely would not survive the change of seasons, the stench of death always in the air, she completed the ritual by whispering, light always shines in the darkness. Light always shines in the darkness. That skeleton of a woman, weakened by who knew how many years in the camp, forced Sally to light her own candle every chance she got. The woman and the girl lit their candles entirely in their minds while standing in ranks waiting to be counted, while marching to and from work in their bunks at night whenever they got the chance. The funny thing was, Sally told the young doctor, somehow that nonsense made me believe I could survive. And that's why I keep the candle with me now. Lighting a real candle is even better than the mental candle. And so I light it every day and say, light always shines in the darkness. And that's how I'm going to outlive this damn cancer. <laughs> you see, friends, Sally learned that the one thing their captors could not take away from them was the ability to use their mind. So this brings me to your assignment. Your mission, should you decide to undertake it, is every morning this week to ask yourself, what is the one thing I can do today to let my light shine? 
What is the one thing that I can do today to let my light shine? It may be to make the first move towards reconciliation in a disagreement in the family or at work. It may be to send a message of encouragement to someone who is having a dark night experience. It may just be a kindly word to a stranger, or it may be purely the gift of your smile. Every morning before beginning your day, decide on the one thing that you can do such that everything else today will be easier or unnecessary. Can I affirm I am the lead domino? I am the lead domino. My light always shines in the darkness. So throughout the day, if you should encounter dark, a dark situation, simply light an imaginary candle and silently affirm, I am the lead domino, and my light always shines in the darkness. Can we say that? I am the lead domino, and my light always shines in the darkness. Friends, you are indeed the light of your world. Your spirituality is the lead domino, and you can use it to set in motion a train of light-filled causation in your world. Say it over and over until its full meaning is embodied in your very soul. Ernest Holmes, who gave the world this great teaching known as the Science of Mind, writes in the Science of Mind textbook, page 475, and I quote, there must come a time in our experience when we speak the conviction that is within us. There must come a time when we, in our experience, when we speak the conviction that is within us. This conviction of the spiritual universe in which we live is real and powerful. The light cannot be borrowed from another, Holmes says. Each has been furnished with a divine torch whose wick burns from the oil of the eternal, ever-renewing substance of faith in oneself and in others. Eric Butterworth, the early New Thought writer, expresses it like this, and I quote, at any time, under any circumstances, we can turn on the light and the infinite energy of love will dissolve darkness, heal broken relationships, and become a veritable protecting presence. Man is a creature of light. When his light is shining brightly in all directions and in all situations, he is imperturbable, indefatigable, and undefeatable. Nothing shall be impossible unto him." Unquote. Butterworth cites a practical illustration. He says, if you walk into a room full of people who are being hampered in their work by a lack of light, and if you have a bright lamp in your hands, would you turn your lamp down in reaction to the dim light of the room? No, you would bring as much light as you possibly could. But if you walk into a room of hostile people, what is your reaction? Normally, you meet their hostility with hostility of your own and walk away saying, what an unfriendly bunch of people. Make them stay in the darkness, they're unlucky. But as Butterworth points out, there really is nothing difficult about letting the inner light of your, divine, of your divinity shine. All we need to do is correct our tendency to turn off our light when we face darkness. So please turn to your neighbor and say, you are the light of your world, thank you for shining. You are the light of your world, thank you for shining. You are the light of your world, thank you for shining. I said your neighbor, not the whole church. <laughs> Friends, every dark night will come to an end when the realization of our true nature as light beings dawns upon our consciousness and we allow our inner light to dissipate the darkness of disbelief, of prejudice and fear. You are the light of your world. You are the lead domino. Thank you for shining. Namaste.